electric sounds fun, but can it keep you safe? Hello, everybody. I am Nick, the naval architect. Yes, electric propulsion needs to keep you safe, especially in emergency scenarios. When you are fighting against the storm and struggling to stay off the rocks, will electric propulsion hold up to the job? So, how to design an electric system that is fit for emergencies and ready to keep you safe? And before we dive in, I just want to give thanks and an acknowledgement to Jeff Cote from Pacific Yacht Systems.、Uh, he provided a lot of advice and background information that I used in making these videos. So I highly encourage you to go check out his YouTube or his website. Definitely worth a read and a look. This stuff can kill you. No joke. Electric propulsion means large currents and large voltages. This is not something that you just experiment with and learn as you go. The electric system needs to protect you even when things get damaged or in an emergency. So, before starting on an electric propulsion project, make an honest assessment of your own expertise. Do you have the skills, the background knowledge, to install your own electric system? Do you understand all of the standards involved? Now, if you have answered with anything less than a completely confident yes, hire an expert. So most of us are going to need some type of an expert, but what level of expertise? The more impressive, the more expensive. I recommend that you start with a marine electrician. These people they do the physical installation, but more importantly, they're going to know the limits of their own knowledge. They're going to be able to handle a large portion of designing that electric system, matching all of the components. But there are a couple parts that might be tricky that could reach past their capabilities of an, as a marine electrician. So this is where you call in an electrical engineer. Engineers go into the reasoning behind the rules, and they know when they can step outside of those normal standards. This can be very important since electric propulsion is still fairly new for yachts, and the organizations that develop these standards, well, they're still refining their rules. So at some point, an engineer might help to fill in those gaps. And I just want to say that I am not an electrical engineer myself, so even I would be consulting with an electrical engineer on a project like this. So bear that in mind for anything you see in this presentation. And remember, always hire the experts to give you the definite answer. We don't just need our propulsion on happy sunny days. I want you to instead imagine that you're in a pure electric boat with all the power stored in the batteries. Now suppose that you're somehow caught in a storm near a lee shore, and you're going to spend all night running at full power trying to pull away from that lee shore. And just as the dawn sun breaks over the horizon, you think you're out of trouble, but the propulsion used up all of your power. The batteries are now completely dead. Uh oh! Time to call for help. With what? Dead batteries mean no electronics, no radio, no options. So when you're incorporating electric power, you need to plan for an emergency power. After you go through. Every last drop of your propulsive power, you still need a reserve, something to turn on your electronics and your basic lighting. Commercial ships do this all the time. We have a dedicated emergency power supply, and this reflects the larger complexity of the power system, because there are other factors you need to consider. For example, your propulsion may not run on that common 12 volt power; it might require a dual voltage system. Where you have one voltage for propulsion and another voltage for your hotel loads, so how are we going to combine these capabilities together to both handle dual voltage and also supply emergency power? Well, there are two major options for emergency power. The first option would be to isolate a smaller 12 volt battery on an automatic charging relay. This smaller battery is sized for your minor electrical needs, like your radio and basic lighting. The ACR keeps that battery charged, but it disconnects during discharge. It isolates that battery, then prevents it from getting discharged. 
This becomes your emergency battery, and it prevents that battery from draining. Then, if the worst happens and you're out of power, you can manually force that ACR to on, which now connects this battery as the emergency reserve. Just enough power to run a radio and some basic navigation. Okay, so that handles the emergency part. But how are we connecting the main propulsion battery to our hotel loads? Well, you're going to use a DC to DC voltage converter. This is going to link your hotel loads with your propulsion batteries. That's assuming that the propulsion batteries are running at some higher voltage. Now this setup of a dual voltage system with an ACR, this provides two major benefits. First, it's relatively simple. And second, all of your charging sources are coordinated at one common point, the propulsion battery. But this solution doesn't work for every option, especially if you're using a less common voltage. For example, there was one electric motor I saw that required 144 volts from the propulsion battery. So you might struggle to find a DC converter that can go from that less common voltage down to your hotel loads. This is a genuine problem with electric power of finding the right equipment for the exact configuration you want. This brings in the second option. Wire two completely separate battery banks. You've got one for propulsion and one for hotel loads. You don't connect them at all. If a propulsion battery is run dead, you still have plenty of power to run your electronics on the hotel battery. Now, personally, I don't prefer this option. It adds a lot of complexity. You need to essentially wire two completely independent electric systems. That's two sets of charging sources, two AC connections. And you need to be very careful to avoid accidental connections between these two systems. That can make grounding and fault tolerances a real challenge. That's going to create a lot more combinations and a lot more ways for things to go wrong. Plus, that second battery for your hotel loads, that's not small. We're adding a lot of extra weight there for that large battery system. In this case, I would absolutely consult with an electrical engineer for this system. And my general recommendation is to avoid this if you can. The preferred option is to use a single system with an emergency battery. Let's talk about ship performance. Slow and steady are not always the safest option. We still need a minimum power level to fight against a storm, to control our heading. Well, how much should that minimum be though? Well, the table on your screen gives you some basic estimates for minimum power levels for yachts of different sizes. But I really have to emphasize that the answer varies wildly. It depends on the ship type, the expected storm conditions. In fact, many yachts are, have conventional diesel engines that are smaller than these minimum power requirements. So don't take this table as absolute truth. The only truly accurate estimate is a custom analysis for your specific vessel. Looking at this huge variability, minimum power requirements really become a highly personal decision. When you're considering this, I want you to focus on storm survival. You can see that the actual storm conditions that you're expected to handle well, they vary with the size of the yacht. And I can tell you that about half of the minimum power you see, half of that just came from the needs for storm survival. And that clearly depends on the size of the storms and the size of the waves. Bigger yachts are expected to handle larger storms. So when you're making this decision, just don't underestimate the electrical equipment in an attempt to save money. Remember, that an underpowered ship can cost you your life, and that's far more expensive than any electrical equipment. So how are we going to store all of that energy? This is the real challenge when we're dealing with electric. Large cruising yachts need a massive reserve. They need the ability to have extended propulsion. This can be fighting off storms or motoring for days to get out of the way of a hurricane. Either way, you need large energy reserves. And the question becomes, how are we going to store that energy? Now, the perfect solution would be batteries, but batteries require far more volume and weight than the conventional option of a generator plus fuel. And it's not a close comparison. The graph on your screen shows the difference between the weight requirements for a battery versus a generator plus fuel. 
and it's only for the very, very smallest of energy storage that the battery is the better option. But for anything large scale, the generator and the fuel, they quickly outcompete the battery. They are much less weight. A large yacht running for two days that could easily require 2,000 kilowatt hours of energy. Now, when we're thinking that big, the generator and the fuel, they are over 1,100% less weight than a battery. There's just no competing with them in terms of saving weight. Now, don't get me wrong. This doesn't make generators perfect. They come with their downsides, like the lack of ability to recapture energy from renewable sources. I love the idea of being able to use wind and solar to recharge a battery. So what I'm really arguing for is a hybrid option, using the best capabilities of the different options. And you have three big options when it comes to how to store your energy. You've got a methanol fuel cell, a diesel generator, or just a pure battery. Now, sure, methanol fuel cells seem like a friendly option. And they're, in terms of energy density, they lie somewhere between a battery and a diesel generator. But these fuel cells require some pretty careful planning. First, the fuel cell doesn't operate like a generator. It supplies power at a much lower rate. Now, this helps for slowly charging a battery, but don't use it for a burst of power. Second, methanol, it's not a widely available fuel everywhere in the world. So you need to think ahead and plan on staying in range of confirmed methanol suppliers. You need to call ahead and ask, do they actually have it? And then finally, methanol is not as clean as you want. It's true that it does release far less emissions than a diesel engine, but it still does release emissions. Most methanol in the world is still distilled from fossil fuels. In terms of CO2 emissions, it's not much better than a diesel generator. It eliminates all the other emissions, but you still have CO2 coming out. Speaking of diesel generators, these are the most common option for electric propulsion. They store huge levels of energy in the form of diesel fuel. And when you combine this with a battery, it really emphasizes the advantages of a hybrid system. You can size the batteries where you're planning to use just those for low energy propulsion a situation where the generator would just barely be ticking over, which is about the most inefficient way to use that engine. But then you go to the other extreme. Assume that the generator is required when you're using full power for any length of time. Well, when you're just guzzling power like that, batteries would be far too heavy. And that's how the generator is going to help save on weight by supplying those large bursts of power. This gives you the best of both worlds in terms of both responsiveness and endurance. But say you don't want to do any of that. You just want a pure battery. Well, that's also possible, but only for a few hours. If you're going to go with pure battery and you want that extended cruising capability to go around the world, I guarantee that sails are going to be your main propulsion method. In this scenario, the battery is mainly supplying your hotel loads. It's working for getting in and out of port. It's going to give you that emergency power if you really need to move without the wind, but it's not going to be your main day-to-day -day propulsion. And even in this case, most sailors include a small generator in case they need that extended capability to run for a couple days. And since we're talking about emergencies, I would just like to remind you that you can have a generator on your boat and not use it for 99% of your life and then just to use it that one time that you needed to save your butt. That still drastically reduces the environmental impact. So what's the best option? Well, the final hybrid selection is going to depend on your usage and your requirements. So to summarize things up, I really want to remind you that designing an electric system, that's more than just spinning the prop. Much of the effort in an electric boat focuses around safety, emergency planning, that comes down to considering your minimum power for a storm and how to store sufficient energy for your endurance. Most boats are going to go for a hybrid option, but don't forget your emergency reserve. In a worst case scenario with no juice in your batteries, you still need a way to call for help. All of these decisions show that the main effort of electric propulsion, it's not spinning the propeller. 
Instead, our electric system delivers something far more important: reliable safety. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the naval architect. How on earth do they do it? Have you ever wondered how the large commercial ships do all these amazing things? DMS brings that same engineering to smaller operators. Take the chance to create a high-performance ship, stand out from your competitors. So check out the website, and together let's build something awesome.